Thanks, everyone, and welcome to this talk. Now, I am trying to make sure that I will be very slow deliberately because of my accent. So if you don't understand anything, do let me know, and I'll be able to answer you. But the topic of what I want to talk about is the wow in Tao. And for those of you who have made me, I am at the James Cook University. So in the School of Veterinary Science, my role is genetics and nutrition. That's what I teach. And I also do research in that area. So just in case if you haven't worked that out, the Tau is Tadikil Australian White. And the team that is behind what we are observing today is the Gilmore family. And we have worked with them, like I just said, for about seven years. And in my mind, I believe that they came up with such a wonderful brew. Now, I don't drink beer, but I know that if you come up with some real brew, it's a mixture of some real, real ingredients in there. And here we have the white dopa, the Paul Dorset, the Texel, and the Van Rui. And again, those of you who were at last year's sales, they know that this particular ram went for 165,000. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but that was an Australian record. But what I'm about talking about this evening is the three tripod stand. One is the FMP, two is the IMF, three is omega-3. I've deliberately shortened them that way because it's easier than me telling you this is long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, you just go to sleep. So the three things I'll be talking about are IMF, FMP, and omega-3. So let's look at the fat melting point. This is what we generally call the slip point test. So the slip point test is all about the melting point. And as, the, as you know, once you eat omega-3, I mean, once you eat the Tadikil Australian white, the meat simply melts in your mouth. Doesn't have that sticking palate thing. And this is because the bones are able to be broken very quickly and it has high levels of low saturated fats. And from the testings that we've done, we found a range from 28 degrees centigrade to 39. What that means is that it is very soft. It is easy to break down and the reason why that is the case is that you have the real unsaturated fatty acids because the bones are easy to break, so they are the good guys. Whereas if you have the saturated fats, those are the really strong ones where the bones are very difficult to break. I've put a photo there of what we do in the laboratory. When you take the Tadikil Australian white meat, we extract the fat, and that's exactly what you see inside that container. So we know exactly how much it is. It is not a guess. It's actually quantifiable. The second tripod is the IMF. We prefer to call it micromabling. So it is your intramuscular fat content. This is what gives the meat its taste, all right? And in we refer to it as high micromabling because you don't see chunks of the fat in Tau. So all you notice is that it's wet. The micromabling is within the tissues. It's when you start cooking, then it begins to drip. And that's what makes it really unique. And from what we have analyzed in the laboratory, you can get as high as 8.2% and as little as 3.4%. Now, the third thing about the Tadikil Australian white is the omega-3s. With the omega-3s, you do have high EPA and DHA. I will explain in a minute what they are. But we've looked at it, and most of the measurements that we've made range from 33 to 69 milligrams per 100 grams, more than what we call a source level. So why are these omega-3 important? They are important because they perform so many functions in the brain, fetal development, and so on. 
Uh, for a minute, just don't bother about the biochemistry in there. All I need you to remember is that we have the EPA, DHA, and DPA. Those are the three key long-chain omega-3s that give the best that you can get from meat. So when you put all those three qualities together, what you get is healthy meat, healthy fat, where you've got the aroma, the juiciness, the tenderness, all rolled into one. So when we started off, we wanted to see what was in the literature, what is in the scientific literature. And what we know is that you can't say anything about meat quality until the animal is slaughtered. And the other thing we found out was that in the literature, a lot of people rely on EBVs, or estimated breeding values, and then marker-assisted selection is something that uh, just coming into the space. And then there's also what we call the GWAS, or genome-wide associations that is very expensive. Our approach was a little bit different. And this is the way I've sort of tried to put it, that the red lights for us at that time was that there are major issues. By the time you find out that a ram is really good, he's already dead. So it means that it's too late for you to be able to make decisions. So our response to it in the amber light there is, well, we either rely on EBVs or we go through what we call BLAP, or base linear unbiased predictions. Now let me make it very clear. EBVs have their place and you can only predict to the best of your capability, but most predictions are not accurate. So in the green light, we now decided that we will use what we call the nutritional um, nutrigenomics, where we'll look for the actual data, we'll take those data while the animals are alive, we'll come back to the laboratory and get real values, and then we can use what we call next generation sequencing, or the use of markers that we refer to as, as SNP. So Tadikil Science was filling in these research gaps. One, by using muzzle biopsy technique, which I will show you in a minute. And then we test this in the lab to get the real data. And we also try to say, what if you put these animals in the feedlot? What sort of response do you get as compared to if you raise them on grass only? And then we use the uh, SNP to be able to look at the markers because they are rapid, they are cheap, and we could use a targeted approach. So we looked at gender effect, we compared grass-fed, we also ran studies in the feedlot with the animals, we also look at the omega-3s, not just in the muscle, but we also looked at it in the liver, heart, kidney, to be able to see how it is incorporated when the lamb eats it, and then we use targeted uh, SNP approach. Now, with the SNPs, I'll just mentioned three genes that we looked at, the SCD, the FAB4, and FASN. Please, I don't want you bugging your mind about remembering this. These are all lipogenic genes because they control lipid metabolism. So we try to publish what we have found by subjecting the work to peer review. So the literature review that we did was published in genes. And this paper is available, it's free of charge. If you go to the website, you can easily download. And as of this morning, there's already been about 4,991 views, about 3,161 downloads, and there have been 12 citations so far. But the research questions we were asking were three. So three research questions. The first one was, if we use line breeding, and if we use gender, do they have any impact at all on the meat-eating quality if you were raising these animals on pasture? And what we found, again, I'll try to summarize this data. One was that in terms of the antioxidants and phenolics that we looked at in Tadikil Australian White, line breeding and gender didn't have any impact. And when we looked at the intramuscular fat content and when we look at the fat melting point, we also found that these were driven more by either being a ewe or being a lamb rather than the impact of line breeding. That's all I've tried to summarize in there. Same thing with the fat melting point, being lower in the females than in the rams, but for line breeding, 
what we found was that there was absolutely no difference. Now, the results of this study, if you want to find out details of that, we've published that in a journal called Antioxidants. The IF there refers to the impact factor of the journal. As scientists, we always want to make sure that we're publishing in journals of high integrity and the matrices are there. Again, I've put in the digital object identifier so that if you go into the website and you click, you can download the full paper itself. So from research question one, what we found out was that if you're using grass-fed only, gender differences come in because the females tend to lay in more fat than the males. But apart from that, inbreeding coefficient because of line breeding had absolutely no issue on variable that is related to meat eating quality. So what that means is that it guarantees the consistency of the meat eating quality that you have. So that raised a further question for us. What if we put them in a feedlot? So we ran a study with about 75 of the lambs where we put them out into the feedlot for about 47 days, feeding them three different feeds, the control, the grilled grain, and then omega-3 fortified diets. Again, these results have been published just two weeks ago. Frontiers in Veterinary Science actually published the outcome. But what we found was that if you fortify the diets with omega-3, what you do see is that there's an enhancement in feedlot performance, in carcass quality, in fat melting point, and carcass characteristics. The second part of the results, we also published that in a journal called Biology, and where we demonstrated that the nutritional enhancement goes beyond the meat. It actually goes into the kidney, the heart, and the liver, where you're getting very high uh, impacts in there. Again, I'm aware that I'm not talking to a scientific audience, so I've tried to minimize the amount of data, but I thought i will just put these results out there from the journal where we showed the differences between the three different diets. And what you see is that with the omega-3, you do have a lowered intake in green. So the animals eat less, but then grow more. So in terms of feed efficiency, you get better output. So the results, showed that feed intake, feed efficiency, and average daily gain were actually improved, and that carcass traits and wholesale cuts were also improved. And that led us to the third and final question, are there any functional SNPs that we can use as potential markers? SNPs are DNA markers that we can use to select animals very early so rather than waiting for the animals to be slaughtered, you can make that decision when they're still very young. So research question three was, are there any functional SNP in lipogenic genes that actually affect the eating quality of tau lambs? Now, for a moment there, I'm gonna splash you with quite a lot of data, but please don't be discouraged. I won't spend time talking about it. This is what we do where in the laboratory we look at the DNA of every single animal. The gender, we look at where it's coming from and so on, and then we extract the DNA and then go through a rigmarole of so many processes. What you see there is an output of whether the animal has certain functional SNPs. So we identify those SNPs that you can see in different red colors. It shows the arrangement of the DNA, and from there we crunch the data and run a lot of bioinformatics. I think I will not bog you with all the details, but what we have found is that the results of this work was published in a journal called Foods. Uh, and in Foods, what we found was that there are 20 functional SNPs that we can actually use to generate markers in this particular breed. So these are in the SCD, the fast N, and also the BP. So in the following slides, all I will show you is just photos of what we've done, the steps that we take them in terms of the research methodology. First of all, we look at grass-fed versus lot-fed, like I told you. We also go to the Animal Ethics Committee to get permission for us to be able to do the work because the university expects us to stick to other animal welfare rules 
So we design experiments, we look at the muzzle biopsies, and then we go through a targeted uh, SNP. So when we started, this was the basic design, where we had the parental, we also had those that are born after them, and then we tested them in different stages. Uh, the first step is to get a veterinarian to go into the animal to be able to take a sample of the tissue so you know that you are dealing with actual data. And all we take is just five grams, very little, not much. And we bring them back into the laboratory. And in the laboratory, we extract the intramuscular fat, and then we determine the fat melting point or the slip point. Not only that, we also subject them to fatty acid analysis, usually about 36 different fatty acids. So we know which ones are the long chain ones, which ones are the omega-3s. And so if you were to put the different stages that we go through from the meat through to the DNA extraction, we run what we call a PCR, we amplify the DNA, and then we go through next generation sequencing, and then we crunch the data. Basically, it takes such a long time, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of resources to be able to tease out the information that we need on individual animals, and then we can come back to Graham and say, Graham, we suggest that you use such and such a, la a ram, or you use such and such a U, based on actual data. So in summary, what we have found is that there are challenges. And these challenges are that meat quality can only be determined after slaughter. At that stage, it's too late to make decisions. So the current strategies are to use EBVs or for you to go back to the pedigree or to use ancestral records. So if you don't get good records, what you get out of EBVs is just an estimate and doesn't really make much sense to us. And so we've come up with novel nutrigenomics where we can look at the muzzle biopsies, we can analyze those in the lab, and we can actually tell you what markers are associated with these uh, genes. So the outcomes are that you can use SNP marker assisted selection, you can improve lamb eating quality, you can improve the healthy omega-3 within the lambs, you can make that decision very early while the animals are young, and these are based on lab tested data, not estimates, which means that the precision, the accuracy and reliability are much more. Now the way I see it, the tau is the ship of the future, or for the future. And our vision, the way I see it is that the world is getting bigger. We need to provide them with food that is nutritious. So in terms of food and nutrition, I see the tau making a role. And we need to move with the times because the future is embedded in emerging technologies. And these are some of the technologies we are using at the moment that are always evolving with time. I also see that health and well-being would be something that Tao can contribute to by providing consumers with something that is very healthy, something that's really reliable. And whether we like it or not, we have to tell ourselves that we are living in times of climate change and there is a lot of sustainability issues in there. Now, I'm not a politician and wouldn't want to go into the politics of climate change, but certainly I believe that looking at emissions coming out of our production system will be quite relevant as time comes on. I'd like to acknowledge people that have helped us. There are so many scientists that we involve in the work that we do. There are many industry partners that work with us and there are technical assistances that we have received from different people, and such are the research grants that we have from the Australian Commonwealth, from Tardikil itself, and also from the Science Industry and Foundation. Now, I should say that I have a lot of foot soldiers who do the work, and they are the people who are the real heroes out in the lab. And I should say that our group is very international, so we have me from Nigeria, we've got John from Sudan, Felista from Kenya, we've got Arash from Iran, we've got people from Victoria, from Tasmania, we've got people from France, we've got people from Vietnam who all work together with me in the lab, everybody contributing something. 
Uh, it doesn't end there. We do have other scientists. Um, you see Peter Nichols there from CSIRO. He works with us as well. He's an honorary fellow with us. So it involves a lot of teamwork, but all of us working in the same direction to make sure that we're providing farmers with relevant information that they can use in making crucial decisions. So let me take you back to where we started, and that is the wow in Tao, but the actual proof is in the taste. I hope you can stay around and have a taste of what we can produce, and then you can make up your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for paying attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.